um, welcome back. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our first speaker, Professor Raffaele Ferrari from the <clears throat> Earth Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences Department at MIT. EPS is um, one of our participating departments. I'm very happy to have EPS and mathematics from the uh, School of Science as one of the departments who participate in the CSC PhD program. And Professor Ferrari is one of the people who work on computation uh, in EPS. So uh, Professor Ferrari is the Cecil and Ida Green Professor of Oceanography and is also director of the program in Atmospheres, Oceans and Climate. And he's a phys physical oceanographer with interest in in the connection between the, the ocean and the and climate, and he has been leading this um, uh, multi-institute effort to produce a high fidelity uh, uh, climate models that which involves Caltech, MIT, uh, JPL, and NPS. So um, today he's going to tell us about his efforts to improve the physics of climate uh, ocean models. Please, Rafael. Okay. Thank you very much for having me. And yes, this what I want to talk to you about a bit is how we can improve the physics of climate models with an emphasis on the ocean. Uh, I will try to articulate why I think we need to do that. And this is part, as uh, uh, Nicola said, of the multi-institutional effort of creating a new generation climate model. And I explain why I think we need to do that. Um, in particular, I'm going to work, talk about the work we are doing at MIT. So this new climate models involves a component in the atmosphere and the ocean and land. And in particular, at MIT, we are working the ocean component. That's why that emphasis. There are a lot of people involved uh, in the project at MIT. In particular, there are three faculty that are in CSE, Alan Edelman, myself, and John Marshall. So I think it's quite appropriate to talk within this context, and I hope that number of students might get interested in this kind of challenges. Oops. So maybe the first slide is easy to introduce. Why do we even care about uh, writing climate models? And uh, this picture is from the 2014 uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report. And it shows just the temperature increase over the last century for the whole world. And you see that the world has gotten warmer by about one degree on average. That warming is not constant. It tends to be stronger at high latitudes and over land and over ocean, so there are patterns. We have strong reasons to believe that this warming is associated with anthropogenic emission of greenhouse gases. What we'd like to know is moving forward in the future, how much warming are we committing to and how is it related quantitatively to anthropogenic emissions? And for that, we need to use science and in particular uh, numerical models because the dynamics of the system are complex enough that we cannot just solve it with pencil and paper. And uh, why do I think there is work to be done? Because we do have models, but I would contend that models we have today are probably not up to the task of answering the questions that we have about how to mitigate and adapt to this change. In particular here, I'm showing at what carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere we expect or climate models predict that we will have a temperature increase of two degrees C compared to pre-industrial values. I choose two degrees C because that's the value that has been uh, agreed on in the 2016 Paris Agreement as a threshold that we should try not to exceed. It's not important whether that number is particularly relevant, it's arbitrary. But here, what I want to show you is that if I take 29 of these IPCC, as it is called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, models used in this panel, and I show at what carbon dioxide concentration they predict that we would cross these two degree threshold. Well, some models predict that that will happen at around 600 parts per million concentration in CO2 in the atmosphere called PPM, so 600 PPM. Other models predict that we cross that threshold already at something like 400 ppm and pretty much all values in between. For reference, we are already at 415 ppm today. So there's clearly a large range of values that are predicted and that has serious consequences in how we should respond to these changes. 
because if I try to convert this carbon concentration at, in years, meaning when do we expect to cross that threshold in time, if we make an assumption of uh, a world that doesn't change its behaviors in terms of anthropogenic emission carbon dioxide, well, for the models on the right-hand side of this panel, we would exceed the concentration at which we have a two degree warming already in 20 years from now, but for the models on the left hand side here, we would exceed it in 40 years from now. That's a full generation difference. Clearly the mitigation and adaptation policy we would have to use in one case are very different if it's 20 year time scale versus a 40 year time scale. So these models are not at the point where, or they all agree in a sense, if we look at that picture that the world is getting warmer moving into the future as long as we continue emitting greenhouse gases, but at what rate is something we don't know accurately enough to make a lot of policy decisions that would need to be made. Just to show that this uncertainty really stems for difficulties in reproducing the present state of the system, not just the future. Uh, now I'm showing in the upper panel here is a difference between the sea surface temperature and time to put the notion emphasis because of what I've been going to be going to be talking about and what we are doing at MIT. Uh, if I look at the difference between uh, the mean state of uh, these 29 climate models that you've seen before versus uh, observation on sea surface temperature from satellite data. What you tend to see that there is a lot of regions we read there, that's regions where the models predict a warmer temperature, sea surface temperature than it is observing climate. And you see these differences are pretty large. We're talking about two degrees differences in most of the Southern hemisphere. This is what is called the Southern Ocean, south of the continents around Antarctica. There are some regions in Eastern boundary currents. And there are also some regions where instead we under predict uh, or we predict temperature which are too cold in present day. Another way to look at the same uh, picture is instead looking as a function of time. So this is for the last century, essentially for the last, well, last century and moving to the next century. And we are seeing the temperature now averaging only over the Southern hemisphere predicted by again, a number of these uh, uh, models. And you see all these models predict that at some point the temperature will increase as anthropogenic carbon emission keep going up. But you see that there are also very large differences in tem mean temperature that these models predict. This is averaging between 50 and 60 degrees south. So in the band, it's down here. So there are clearly differences across models. And these differences have nothing to do with our uncertainty about how human might change their behavior moving to the future, because all these models are forced in the same way. It's just different somehow in the physics included in these models. So why is it? that models that are supposedly trying to solve the same equations are producing different results. Well, it comes to a simple problem. We do know to a large extent the equations that uh, dictate the dynamics and thermodynamics of the ocean and the atmosphere and land, some better than others, but in particular in the ocean, we know that the dynamics and thermodynamics pretty well. The problem is that we cannot solve the equations uh, on the scale of motion that we observe in the ocean in the atmosphere. We know that motions happen from planetary scale of thousands of kilometers down to hundred kilometers, down to 10 kilometers, one kilometer to hundred meters. There are puff of air on centimeters and millimeters. We cannot solve the equation on a fine grid of a few millimeters globally of the full world because computational limitation, computer limitation, computer computing limitation presently just don't allow us to get all the way there. So instead what we have to do we take the full Earth depicted here and we just discretize it with a mesh grid, which for climate models used today typically will have a resolution of 100 by 100 kilometers in the horizontal and about 100 meters in the vertical. And then we solve the equation on these blocks. So we are not really solving the full dynamics. There is a lot of physics that essentially falls through the cracks of this model. You can think that at this resolution, the whole of Massachusetts would be represented with uh, three grid points. Uh, there are definitely clouds on scale smaller than that. You can imagine that if you're talking about land, there is the heterogeneity in vegetation on scale smaller than that. The same is true in the ocean. Here I'm showing a picture from a very high resolution numerical models of the ocean that we can run for a much, for a very short time scale, not for climate studies. Uh, here you see Japan and in color you see surface currents. In particular, I'm showing vorticity, but it doesn't matter what it is. 
but this is what is called oops the Kuroshio current that is meandering across and generating a lot of turbulent eddies. And again, in white, I'm showing the grid of a climate, typical grid of a climate model. You see that there is a lot of dynamics that happen at scales smaller than the water model can reproduce. It turns out, therefore, that what models had to do, they had to make approximation to represent the collective effect of physics on scales smaller than the grid that they do resolve. On larger scale, they resolve they solve the proper equation, but not on smaller scales. And apparently, the different approximations that are made in reproducing these small scale physics are different in different models, and they have large scale consequences. So one answer to the problem could be to say, well, uh, maybe all we have to do is just to wait for computing power to uh, increase, and eventually the problem will be solved. Uh, I would argue that that's not necessarily the cure to the problem because over the last 40 years at least, computing power has increased by 10 to the eight fold, but the scale of computer models hasn't really gone up by that much. A lot of the biases you've seen in uh, this, for the figure on uh, crossing thresholds of two degrees C have been with us for a long time, at least for probably the last 40 years. Uh, in particular, I think because we have put most, more effort in making our models more comprehensive, including more and more components like land, like biogeochemistry, chemistry, the atmosphere, all important aspects, but without going back and reducing uh, the deficiency in the representation of the subgrid scale physics, as we call it, that the models do not resolve. So what I think is that we are now in a position where we can actually make progress on this uh, challenge because of three advances that have happened over the last, over the recent past. One is that computational power has become, has increased, but in particular through the development of new architectures like GPUs, computer models for the moment are not able, or climate models, sorry, are not written in a way that can take advantage of this new architecture. So we can definitely increase computing power. The second thing is that by using high resolution simulation that resolve locally small scale physics, plus the increased availability of Earth observations that are becoming more and more comprehensive. We could use all this data set to train using ideas that borrow from machine learning and artificial intelligence. We could use all this data set to better train the parameterization of subgrid scale physics. So there is really an opportunity to make our the skill of our model much stronger. And this is the idea behind this uh, Climate Modeling Alliance that uh, uh, Nicholas alluded to this large uh, multi-institutional project we are involved in, where the idea is that we're going to have, we're writing the core of a new uh, climate model that is written in the Julia language so that can take advantage of modern architectures. But what we're going to do is that this model will use available global observation. This is flows that profile the ocean regularly uh, everywhere. Satellite information that give us information about surface current and surface ocean temperature and salinity. Then we are also going to use a lot of high resolution simulation embedded in this model as spun up automatically. And this data set will be used to constrain the physics on the subgrid scale of the model to improve its skill. And so we are trying to build all this machinery. And I'll show you just an example in practice of how we're going to go about that mostly looking at the, how the high resolution simulation can help us reduce uncertainty uh, in the representation of subgrid scale physics. So as an example, uh, I'm showing you here um, the evolution of how deep does winter turbulence penetrate in the ocean interior. What I mean by winter turbulence is that as we enter winter, there is substantial cooling of the surface of the ocean that generates plumes of cold water that sink in the interior and mix the ocean. This turbulence in winter gets pretty deep. If you see here in the North Atlantic winter, you get down to 400 meters deep penetration of turbulence. In the same way, in the whole southern hemisphere, turbulence can penetrate three, 400 meters below the surface in response to this cooling. It turns out the climate models have a very hard time to get boundary layer depths of turbulent penetration as deep as observed. And indeed, this is part of the reason why you had this very large warm biases in the southern hemisphere they are pointed out at the beginning of the talk. Um, the reason for that warm bias is indeed that as turbulence penetrates deep in the water column, it mixes towards the surface very cold water. So the surface gets quite cold. The models don't mix deep enough and that's why they had a warm bias. So why does that bias arise in numerical model? Well, 
um, we can try to address, uh, we'll get to answer that question, but first what we had to do, we decided that we would write, we start developing numerical code, we call it those shenanigans, um, which resolve the turbulence in response to surface cooling at a very high resolution, so we can run on a very small patch of ocean, much smaller than the grid size of the climate models. But in that case, we resolve the full three-dimensional turbulence and we can see at what rates the turbulence penetrate in the ocean interior. And we can use that as our validation. What does the real turbulence in the ocean should look like? And this is a simulation that we're doing. So here we are looking at the ocean. We are inside the ocean looking towards the surface. As the surface is being cooled, you see these plumes of cold water sinking into the interior and creating this turbulent and mixing. So we developed this code, you can run very fast on GPU, so we can run a lot of this simulation very quickly. And we can run them in different configurations. So now here I'm showing you the result of the previous simulation, but now I'm showing the full three-dimensional solution at some time. The color is temperature, this is our 3D box, it's just by 100 by 100 meters, so it's a very small box. And you see that it's pretty uniformly blue at the top. That's because there was convection here, cooling from the surface that create mixing. The temperature is pretty uniform. The turbulence is mixing and keeping that temperature colder and colder, but uniform. Uh, down to uh, that, the here is around 30 meters or so. Below that, instead, the temperature starts decreasing very rapidly with depth. That's because the ocean interior is typically strongly stratified, as we say, meaning that the temperature is increasing with depth. It would increase linearly all the way to the surface, except that when you generate turbulence, you start eroding that stratification. Indeed, on the right, I'm showing a zonal average picture of what you see on the left. So now I'm just showing the temperature as a function of that zonally average in the picture on the right. And you see that the temperature is nearly uniform in the upper 30 meters, and then it starts increasing with depth. Clearly, in, in climate models cannot resolve all these three-dimensional turbulence, so we want to find a way to predict directly what is the evolution of this vertical profile, because this will be just one grid point in your model in the horizontal, and we just want to see how the turbulence penetrates in the vertical. Uh, so generally, the way you do it, you write a subgrid scale model based on a basic physics that you understand, the use scaling laws, and in particular for this problem, you would write an equation for the evolution of temperature, in the vertical, they said this is just more, we call it the column model, it's just in one grid point in your climate models. And the parameterization will depend on a vertical divergence EDC or some flux of temperature. And this is your parameterization of some grid model, if you want to call it. This flux will depend on temperature, only on the vertical dimension, on the surface heat flux, how strongly you cool, and on a number of non dimensional parameters. And in particular, for the models I showed, the people in the audience that might know what I'm talking about. We are going to use what is called the KPP subgrid scale model. It's a very typical model using most climate in, in most climate models uh, uh, on the ocean side to represent the evolution of turbulence. And so what I'm going to show down here now in blue, I see the result of the LES simulation. So I take the zonal average. And I'm going to show you how it evolves in time. And the green dots are the results of the prediction from the climate models the blue line is a zonal average that resolves the full three-dimensional turbulence, while instead the green dots just solve a one-dimensional equation for a certain set of these non-dimensional parameters. And if I let it go in time, you see it doesn't do a terrible job, except that the base, the boundary layer starts evolving a bit differently. It goes a bit deeper or faster uh, than the green dots, uh, meaning the parameterization. And there is an accumulation or error over time in this simulation. Indeed, this bias is already of order of 10 meters after eight days, and you can expect if you go for a full season, uh, the biases of the difference, it can be hundreds of meters. So that shows, first of all, these parameterization are not terrible. Clearly, that's why they're using climate models, but they're also not perfect. So what could you do to improve on this parameterization now that you believe that you have a simulation, the three-dimensional simulation that represents the physics, and we can show that by comparing two observations where we have them. Well, one approach that we've taken is indeed you could use Bayesian approaches to optimize what is the value of this non-dimensional parameter that you should be using in your parameterization, right? So in particular, these are two of the parameters that enter in this parameterization, one that sets the strength or the magnitude of the turbulence, and the second parameter really uh, represents how deep the turbulence penetrates. 
And I can do just here we're using a Marco chain Monte Carlo simulation. This was the initial value of the parameter are typically used in the climate models. And we do an exploration of parameter space until we find what is the optimal value that gives us the best match or the best reproduces given this model for these parameters that best reproduces the evolution of the temperature profile over time. Uh, it's a probabilistic approach. So indeed we get the whole PDF. So Nick Trefetten would be happy that now the talk following his is actually using some probability, so we cover all bases for all interests. But now we have supposedly a better model. I can run the simulation. Now the blue dots are this optimized version of the same model as before, and now this does much better than the previous model. You can say, okay, so now I improved the model. I have a better constrained parameter uh, subgrid scale model, so I'm fine. But it turns out that the story is not that simple because here I'm showing you now I can repeat the same exercise, but not just for one simulation, the one I've shown you before, but now for a whole set of different simulation here in particular, we change the stratification, how fast the temperature will change in below the surface of the ocean. So we run a whole bunch of different simulation now with this fast code, uh, ocean anigans, we can run a whole suite of them very quickly. And then we can repeat the optimization for every case. And this is in particular one of these parameter values and we show and which controls the depth to which turbulence penetrates. And we show that you have to use different values of this parameter for every simulation if you want to get a good match. That tells you if you want to call it that you were overfitting in doing this exercise or more fundamentally that there is some flaw in this parameterization because this parameter C was supposed to be a universal parameter but it doesn't really fit. Uh, or you can, uh, there is no single parameter that gives you a good prediction for the penetration of convection everywhere in the ocean. And that explains why oceanographers have struggled with this uh, subgrid scale model, because no matter what they did, they could tune the parameters to work well in mid latitudes, but then at high latitudes, like in the Southern Ocean, they didn't work as well. Some work that has been happening to move beyond this status of affair, that now really relies a bit more on machine learning, was that then what we can do, we can essentially use a simple model that is our first guess. We have models that do have some skill in giving us more or less the shape of the profile, but then we can use some neural network to learn the part of the dynamics that the model wasn't able to reproduce. So we try to use both the information we already have this prior, and then we add a correction that should allow us to now have a model that works in very different configuration. And this is what I show you here now. This is the work done by a CSC student, actually, Ali uh, Ramadan. And now you see the evolution of uh, the LES solution for two different setups. And in blue, you can hardly tell the difference. There is the solution uh, with the neural network, so machine learning trained. Now, this parameterization works across different states. So now you can fix that bias and have a parameterization work in different configuration, not just uh, for example, mid latitude, but it can work also in a Southern Ocean like state. And I'm coming to the end of my time. Uh, so, what I'm trying to explain here is that I think that we have this idea of developing a new climate model using Julia as our language because it allows us to have uh, to take advantage of uh, modern computer architectures and have code that is easier to use. And then we want to focus our efforts in improving the representation of subgrid scale physics. That might seem obvious, but that's not where the community has gone by far and large. And the reason why we can do it is that we can generate high resolution simulation and use uh, many high resolution simulation within a grid point of the large scale climate model that we can run for a short period of time, but just to reproduce the physics that the model should be capturing. And then use machine learning approaches to train the parameterization. And then we also use global observation to do that. Not only that should help us get better representation of the subgrid phase scale physics, but something I didn't really talk about is that in this exercise, we can also estimate the uncertainty associated with our subgrid scale model. So how accurate they are, what is the error associated? No subgrid model will ever be perfect because it's not an analytical solution of the equations. But once we know the uncertainty of this parameterization, we can also estimate and propagate the uncertainty in our climate projection. So we know what is the error bar in the projection we've done, something that nowadays we can't do um, with climate models because we don't know how much uncertainty there is with these subgrid scale models. Now, I think I'm running late, but um, just to point it out, of course, the final goal would be not just to have a model that has um, 
more predictive skill, but once we have that system, since we can automatically spawn high resolution simulation everywhere we want on the globe, we can use that same approach to make forecast locally and regionally to help adaptation and uh, mitigation policies. And I'd be remiss if I didn't point out who has done most of this work. This is a number of uh, students, uh, postdocs and researchers at MIT, but I would like to hide, oops, can you still see this? Highlight a few names, Adeline Hillian and Uliana Peterberg are two Europe students that are working with us. Ali Ramadan is the CSC student that has worked on this parameterization and two research, Andres Sousa and Gregory Wagner that has done a lot of the work. And I'm just leaving some of uh, uh, the publication we've done for people who might be interested in the work. And I should acknowledge support from Schmidt Futures, Poland Foundation, the NSF and the Odi Environmental Foundation. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very nice talk. Um, do we have time for a couple of questions, quick questions? Any questions, quick ones? Uh, I'd ask one. If Please. There's... Please. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that really interesting talk. I was wondering just um, in your experience, if you uh, didn't do a Bayesian approach, but maybe a variational approach based on optimization, um, how the two approaches compare. And uh, obviously you not have the uncertainty quantification, but even if you just um, compare that um, optimization based solution to the posterior mean, um, I was wondering whether they would be similar. So if you just recover a point prediction, um, yeah. So uh, you're absolutely right. To get the point prediction, uh, there is no advantage. Actually, there might be advantage in optimization processes. Um, Bayesian approaches can be merged together just to zoom in and use deepest descent approaches just to find your uh, optimal point. What we always want to have is also uncertainty on the parameters. The reason for that is that once then you take this parameterization and you put it in a global model, uh, it's likely that you also want to constrain with global observation, the parameterization. So you want to know what is the wiggle room in each parameter before you move outside plausible physical range. This is one of the big limitations in climate modeling today where people feel free in the end in this parameterization to tune the parameter to whatever they need in order to get the global solution to be on track. But sometimes then when you go back, you find out the parameters used are not physically plausible. That seems problematic. So that's why we're taking that approach. But probably a blend of more traditional data simulation approaches and Bayesian approaches is definitely the way to go. And we are exploring some of these ideas with Kalman filters. Thanks. Any other quick questions? No? Okay. Um, thank you very much, Rafaele, for a very nice talk and for being on time. <laughs>